Provided a detailed analysis of structural limitation of right-wing politics in Bengal, alongside the mechanism and the processes through which right-wing politics works in the local government. But I'm interested to understand what is the structural limitation to the franchising politics itself. Okay. And the second question is: You have highlighted, I mean, significantly highlighted, and citing range of data that how this franchising politics limits the state capacity. Overburdening the middle classes, taxes per capita more than two hundred crores. So, do you think that the state capacity, limited state capacity, can be used further by the right wing, you know, alongside mixing with Hindutva and law and order issues, to penetrate the mystical realm of politics in Bengal? Thank you. Thank you. It's actually um, presenting the uh, presentation. Uh, my question has to do with your conceptualization of chronic capitalism. Uh, That's related to the non-corporate kind of crony capitalism. So, uh, other than being crony, how do you see, or do you see any other differences with the Sanyal conceptualization of real economy in difference to non-corporate capitalism? And second part is that the model of uh, franchise politics, which you are talking about, has to do more with the accumulation. So, how can we uh, like uh, associate this the need economy or the informal Grouping, because their uh, whole contention is based on subsistence and need. Yeah. In a broad in a form of benefit, is in benefit. The the first is, I mean, how is this different from petrol, traditional petrol economics? I mean, it seems like state partially of the state is acting at a more regional level. How is this? Like the, the other point that you made, that your lo social lo location determines how do you see the whole structure. So it's the same kind of thing. This side about the complex system as well. If, if if you are inclined, you would see the complex system differently. Whereas regional patrol, you would see the complex system very differently. So how is this whole whole formulation different from a traditional petrol economy? That is the first. The second is uh, 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 the second is uh, with regard to crony. Non-corporate crony capitalism. Uh, that's 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 at the heart of the paper. That is something new. Uh, if I remember correctly, that is something Ankur also raised that that the most important aspect of theorization of non-corporate capital was that the basis of that is sustenance. So now you you are saying that at the heart of that is accumulation and then political violence. Annihilation, not sustenance. So why why should we frame it like that? Why should we not just go out of its way itself? Why why to take Sanya, Patel and Sanya? You say that we would not have arrived here if they would not. You think yeah, that that correct. But but let us take some other frame. Say Barbara Hay, that is why or other frames to frame those kinds of questions with regard to black economy and other things. So for Coming from the other direction. So the third question, and since you raised the issue, I mean, there are going to be some other. He wrote a very provocative piece in Indian Express after Mukta Mohan in 2016. He called that what is happening in Bengal is a kind of churning, where subalternization and unionization is coming out as a poison and nectar kind of. That's the literary issue. The other major point, and that is something that he made, that continuously he was making that the center of Bengal politics has now shifted from the centers of Kolkata to bazaars of Malwa. That's 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 that is what he said. So the first structural limit that you pose, that BJP won't enter in, I mean, that 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 you won't enter into Bengal, is that I mean, it trains its guns against intelligence. There is some other saying that it has already, uh, the TMT has already done. 
how do you respond to that 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 I wish I could actually do justice to all these questions. Um, they are somewhat, some, some somewhat related. Instruction, this is the basic question of instruction, limitation of instruction. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm the Togo body on the middle class. I think economy is still Togo body. Because they won't, they don't have industrial life, like many states in the south and the west. As a result, what has happened is that these entrepreneurships that you find at the ground level <coughs> is a small scale. They are sometimes related to big capital, and most of the time they are not. You know, it is possible, I'm told that now you can have ancillary industries. <coughs> the traditional idea was that you need to have a big industry. And then inform the industry and the ancillary around it. But given the kind of the speed of transportation and other things, you can have ancillaries elsewhere. But as you know, that you know, I mean, there's a net migration, out migration from it, and therefore you know, it doesn't create the kind of job that is required. And I think that is a huge structural limit to transport because. The distributive function of franchising conditions, which is uh, the, uh, the, the factor responsible for its relative legitimacy below there, you know, I mean, that itself cannot be sustained with this kind of thing. It is, uh, I mean, it's a very small scale entrepreneurship, mostly driven, the, the most important entrepreneur in Bengal is the government. That, that is the problem of money. And unless that is rectified, uh, I think that this cannot be sustained, and that's a huge structural uh, conflict, which will eventually give rise to different uh, results and different formulations. Now, crony ca capitalism of uh, uh, non corporate and big economy, uh, this is very different from the big economy that. Sanyal was looking at the economy, and first of all, you know, I don't think that there is a non capital sector in the sense that there is actually an applied capital. Capital is all encompassing, and you cannot have a sector or a sphere which can be sustained, which can be available outside the influence of capital. So, any economy that you have is uh, uh, inductive within this capitalist system that we have. And uh, in capitalist system, accumulation is something that can also happen. I mean, the horizon of primitive accumulation is something that uh, Elman was also talking about. You know, I mean, uh, this primitive accumulation doesn't necessarily take place at the large scale level of the corporations. It can also take place at the small scale. For instance, where you have this illegal mining, what is happening for, for the sand mine? This is also a primitive form of accumulation which is taking place. And, and this is an informal economy which is sustaining this primitive accumulation at the ground level. So it is simultaneously accumulative as well as distributive because it is giving jobs to people. In the, uh, the local people who are getting some jobs there. And you know, I mean, that is how it sustains itself. That, that is how, for instance, it has got a local support system. Otherwise, who would have uh, accepted this kind of uh, plunder of natural resources which takes place uh, by this small entrepreneur uh, capitalist? So, accumulation does take place. Some sectors profit from such accumulation. But it also has a distributive function, which is which results in its legitimacy and sustenance. Without that, it cannot sustain itself. Now, how is it different from that patronage politics which Supreme raised? You know, the patron client relationship, which we knew about, 
which is discussed especially in the context of power systems. First of all, the economy is good. It is much more market oriented. And in market oriented economy, you more have transactions than technology. Because technology requires a degree of moral sense between the players, the petrol and the planet. And that, do happen, that does happen when, for instance, the state offers something. A petrol system of, uh, say, the new welfare system. It, it is definitely a petrol system at certain time. But that is a part of the story. Because much of the benefits now carry through the market. And, and this is what this uh, franchise equality is about. Because it, you know, in a way, uh, makes use of the local market for the stability of a certain constituency, for the maintenance of a certain constituency of constituency. So that is, that is the kind of uh, analytical distinction between the patronage system and this conversation that I do. Now, um, and, and of course, uh, violence is part of this because the territorial integrity of this franchise is something which is studied. Without that territorial hold, you cannot continue to have that kind of uh, uh, system going. And, and, and you are, you know, thinking the sovereignty. So territorial sovereigns have to have that sovereignty within that particular sphere, and that has to be an absolute and non-policy. And any absolute and non-policy can have observed to me that it requires legal power. It cannot be sustained. And, and that is uh, another question which was raised earlier, that are people foolish? People are not foolish. People are actually making use of this format to the best of their ability. Either in order to replace it by, I mean, in the hope of replacing it by an alternative kind of politics, or for, for that matter, playing along with it in order to gain the material uh, and security.
So gender as because you know BJP was perceived as an ascending power, and and uh, uh, I also mentioned that many of the BJP leaders, you know, there is no BJP leader of significance in this. All the BJP leaders of significance were coming from northern India, northern industry. Now, it is not difficult to see, and, and after so many years, 2019, the BJP made such sweeping gains in Bengal. Even now, you don't have a formidable leader in India from BJP. The only leader who is talked about mostly, who is a transport from TNC to then do Odikai, who again has a very limited kind of influence in southern Bengal. Which is making such enormous electoral gains doesn't have any undisputed leadership. Let's say, Hustlers. So I think there is a huge hiatus between electoral results and the cultural foundation of a particular kind of politics. So you can have electoral results of certain kind for some time, but that doesn't necessarily give you a prominent position within the cultural foundation of a particular And that is the difference between electoral polarization and social polarization. BJP has achieved electoral polarization as a polar power. But it is yet to achieve social polarization on the basis to become a polar power. You know? So this is the distinction that one has to keep in mind. And 
you were right in your point, sir, that if the Bhargav hegemony is successfully challenged, of which there is a possibility, then what happens, we will know. But, I mean, this is again the question of everyday politics at the time. That how is the Bhargav hegemony? I mean, for instance, there was a time when sending the child to the school was important. Now sending the child to the English medium school is important. There was a time when folk theatre was important. Jack Folk. Now it is Bollywood, which is more important. So, you know, the cultural fabric is changing. So we don't know what's going to happen to more. But even now, even now, maybe less than what it was 10 years ago, it's important to have an endorsement of the Bhagavad Gita. Or you have to you need to pretend to be a virgin in order to get political drive. For instance, uh, uh, this uh, Obhita's issue, uh, Obhishek. Obhishek behaves like an impeccable virgin without using the kind of language that Mahita uses. So, you know, this, is, this is something which is very, very good. And, and on the other hand, the present crop of CPM leaders, who used to be impeccable Vajrayogs earlier, they are using much more what you call Metholite, which is language of the bazaar. If you, if you listen to their speeches, they are using this language of the bazaar much more than they used to. So they are talking less about Soviet Union and Imperial Union. And I'm talking more in terms of uh, you know, in the language that they do understand. So it's a child. I don't know if the Bhagavad reports will be replaced by certain other as they will be before because of politics. But as of now, it has not been replaced. And uh, in everyday politics as well, you get to see such kinds of things. Even now. And uh, then there was another question about the new violence, the new Eastern violence. So, this is very, very important. Bengal had enormous problems, both at the time of partition and after partition, even in the 60s. Now, there were moments when violence did take place in the run of two elections in 2021, and even now. Mentioned. But at the same time, given the high density of the population and density of the community, I mean, if you go to a village, you don't see a Muslim neighborhood as completely segregated from the They are just side by side. So, if you think that these two communities can sustain a relationship of active enmity, in a situation like that, my understanding is good. In most situations, what happens of communal violence if you read the newspaper report, the locals will tell you that people from outside came and created the trouble. Not the, not the locals. So there is a natural tendency on the part of these locals to live in a degree of harmony, if not good, harmony. So that is significant. And 30% Muslims in the, in the population speaking the same language as the Hindus do. There is a limit to which a wedge can be created. And another thing which is not mentioned by the literature, you know, there was a time, for instance, when in West Bengal we one could watch television program from Bangladesh. Mind you, West Bengal literary uh, production has very little intimacy with Islam. The most of the post-partition uh, literature which has been produced on this side of the border, it's about Hindu. Most. 
now you have uh, certain Dalit literature, which is a minuscule section, so people like Oloni, Gagarni and others, uh, which never found that kind of uh, foundation in the terms of this uh, until very recently. So it's a very upper caste leading literary scene. Even Muslim writers were writing about the standard. Briefly, there was a time when you could watch Bangladeshi television plays. And of course, that's a different society, different culture, and different religion. But you had a taste of what's happening out there. And there used to be Bangladeshi book fairs on, in Calcutta where you could buy Bangladeshi books. But I don't think it was very widespread. But of late, what has happened with social media? This barrier has broken. You know, I mean, now some of the Bangladeshi artists are hugely popular <coughs> in India. Not just among Muslims, but also among Muslims. Like, I mean, uh, Musharraf Kuri, Kuri. This is a Bangladeshi actor. And, and he does funny plays as well as serious plays. If you, if you ever get a chance, there was a particular film uh, on Netflix for some time, not the film, but if you get a chance, do watch it. A film called Formula Rocket. It is about uh, this uh, garment factory fire in Bangladesh, where Mushraf uh, uh, plays the lead role. So you see that these are the kind of uh, movements which are needed. So Muslim society, Muslim Bengali society, that is through literary representation and cinematic representation, they are now gaining in an access into the Hindu literary public space. So I don't know what the results would be, but I suppose that this is something new. 